over in Mexico. So again, we're a little bit delayed, but um, you will be well fed and nurtured, I promise. It is really my pleasure to following on from, from the, the keynote from Dieter um, to move to our next speaker. Uh, who's going to talk to us about mastering Mexico's supply chain unpredictability. Um, and I'm really, uh, really honored that, that he can be back with us and, and obviously worked with us to also bring Dieter here. Um, he's been playing a very key role in, in Audi's San Jose Chiapa plant uh, in logistics and uh, certainly in fulfilling and meeting some of that vision that we've just heard about. Uh, with the Volkswagen Group for nearly 30 years, he's spent a chunk, a good part of that in, the IT, in IT, various functions in group IT, production IT, and logistics IT, so absolutely uh, finger on the pulse when it comes to digital processes as well. Um, started working at Audi Mexico in 2017 and uh, took on the current role recently, well, in, in 21, to, to lead supply chain and logistics uh, across Audi. Um, not only a highly, one of the great leaders in this industry, uh, but always constantly learning. Uh, I just saw on LinkedIn, I think recently completed uh, some master's in uh, a diploma in, in AI and data science. So obviously keeping on top of things and, and, and most recently also um, had a, uh, an honorary doctorate from the International University in Human Development Leadership and Secretary of Public Education. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to welcome Francesco Bravo. Thank you, Paco. Gracias, Chris. Pleasure to have you here. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for the honor of the invitation. I'm glad to see you all here again and talk a little bit about what uh, Mr. Brown was just telling us on the global perspective. How have we been able to implement in our supply chain? Because as you know, uh, and let me talk a little bit about our home in Audi Mexico. We have a very complex supply chain operations because we have the whole uh, supply chain uh, processes from the inbound of the materials from our warehouse for all the processes involved in the building of a car from press shop to assembly line. And we have also the responsibility to ship the finished goods all over the world, but not only. We have also the responsibility to collect all the parts which are produced in Mexico for producing our Q5 in China, and also to supply uh, uh, spare parts for our cars. And we have a very big consolidation center in our uh, factory for the uh, uh, spare part business. So it's very important for us to understand the whole of the supply chain from the perspective coming from the strategy on the Audi brand, and how do we implement it in our plant. Our plant in Mexico is a key in the overall strategy of Audi as a brand, but especially in the supply chain. First of all, because of the advantages that represents to have a plant here in Mexico, and as you know, we don't need to talk about free trade agreements, and Mexico has a very important spot because we have free trade agreements with more than over 100 countries all over the world, and this is a major advantage for us in Mexico uh, uh, against the world. We have also a very important role as part of being a big center of automotive industry here in Mexico with all the suppliers, service providers, and all the partners that we have with you, and the creation of value that we have for the automotive industry here in Mexico is very important. And also very important for me is the best qualified team. In Mexico, we have the highest level of education. As uh, Chris was saying during the presentation, I have had the opportunity to work all over the world with different projects in the Volkswagen wor uh, world. And the level of education that we have in Mexico and the level of specialization that we have in Mexico is at the level of the best in the world. And we are also working to develop this talent. Recent example, uh, we have two managers from Audi Mexico exported now. One is in China, responsible for the inbound of the material, and more recently, one manager that we are sending to the organization of Mr. Brown in Ingolstadt to take part, a very important role in the inbound organization, and having a position in Germany, leading a German team, is for us very important because we are able to develop these talents, but on the other hand, 
we have ambassadors in other plants that are bringing the know-how that they collected from Mexico and the view that we have in Mexico to incorporate it to the global vision and the global strategy that we are presenting here uh, as part of the overall supply chain strategy for the Audi brand. How do we implement it? And before going into examples, let me tell you a personal story. With over 50 years, I learned to surf in this vacation, in this last summer vacation. I am very proud of that because it's extremely difficult. But when I was doing that, I realized it's pretty much like working in supply chain. First of all, you have to carry 15 kilos uh, surfboard to the beach, which is not easy. Walking in the sand, which is not level, which is difficult to walk in. And now you are looking at the similarities with logistics, starting with. Second, you have to swim against the tide to find the right spot to wait for the right wave. No? You spend more time swimming against the tide than really surfing and having fun. Sounds familiar, right? The second point is once you are in the spot where you have to wait for the wave, for the right wave to take, you have to be watching all over the directions because the wave can come from the left, from the right, from the behind, and you have to really be aware of everything. Sounds familiar, right? I am still talking about surfing, not supply chain. And the last one, once you are in the wave, you really have to know the technique, the right technique to step up into the board, to jump into the board, and to maintain your balance in the board when you are moving at a speed that looks like 500 kilometers an hour, it's not true, but it's the feeling. And then you know your shortcomings, no? because I am bad at dancing and moving and all these things. But knowing my shortcomings, I, I really need to balance it and to keep it on the wave. Because the next big thing is know when to fall down and how to fall down not to hurt yourself. But in all this, which sounds like my daily business in supply chain, is a team behind. And this is what you don't see normally, no? The teacher being behind telling you, watch out for this wave, watch out for the other wave, this is the right technique to do, and so on. It's also how I feel in my daily business because we have a very important organization behind us in Ingolstadt which is giving us the support, which is giving us the direction, and making us participants in this definition of the strategy. Because one very important point that uh, Mr. Brown didn't mention is we are also part of the definition of the strategy. We are giving our input. What are the laws in Mexico we have to take care of? We are giving the specific conditions that we see in the market in the North American region, and we are working with the central areas to incorporate this as part of the strategy. And let me give you a couple of examples. Product complexity. Mr. Brown uh, assigned some uh, godfathers to some parts of the strategy. I have the honor to be part of this strategy as godfather or co-godfather in the strategy order to delivery. And my role in this part of the strategy is really to bring this strategy into the operational daily work because I have also the very good luck to have the production control and program planning locally in Mexico within the organization of the supply chain. So we are able to do something with it. And for this part, the possibility to make analysis and to see how the uh, reduction of complexity in some cars can bring us forward in terms of cost, in terms of flexibility, in terms of delivering the car faster to our customer is key, and we are doing that. The second one is the sourcing strategy. We are giving the input to the central areas in Ingolstadt or purchasing department how the localization of certain groups can make us more competitive, and we now will invest in the factory, in the, supply, in the GIS park that you saw, and I invite you to use this infrastructure for us to be more flexible, to have more local suppliers, to have more localization, because as long as we have longer supply chain 
tier one, tier two, and tier three closest to the production facility will bring us more flexibility to react to the disruptions that we all know, I don't have to repeat them, to react faster, quicker, and in a more efficient way. We are making a scenario planning together. In Mexico, you know, we have a very big important operation in the port. Felipe knows it. We are collaborating and working very close with the authority of the port in Veracruz. Every time we have bad weather, we need to adjust our organization. Now we are doing the forecasting based on our historic data, how the behavior will be in the next months, and we try to adjust our forecasting and our operation based on that, and based also on the communication and the input we get from there. Finally, I want to talk about three more topics which are very important part of the strategy. One is resilience and persistence. We adapt our program to disruptions. But resilience is not only adapting to unforeseen changes, but also to develop the people who is resilient enough to support this operation. You all know we are, last year I put the example of the voodoo uh, doll, no? We are all voodoo dolls in logistics receiving 200 emails a day or 200 nails a day in our heads. But we have to be resilient, and the way to do that is to create a scenario planning, to implement this scenario planning together, and now since we are interconnected all over the world, we do it daily with the central functions in Germany. We use technology and data, definitely. We are working in projects with the universities, and also we are working together with the central department, for instance, about artificial intelligence. We are creating the use cases, and we are deciding together in which plan we use which of those use cases and which technology to make the first steps to learn from it and then to spread it out in all the plans. Of course, the topic of sustainability is very important for us. We have more than 130 projects in the whole organization of supply chain, but also uh, in San Jose, Chiapa, to make sure that we fulfill all of our targets of environment and social responsibility. ESG has become the newest trend, and to be socially responsible is a major important part of our strategy. I want to answer in advance one question that you will always have. I, sorry, how do I get back? Because you saw we have the web page, which is our, uh, thank you very much, is our platform for B2B. You are always asking how do we can collaborate together. This is the way, get registered in our B2B platform, and then we can do or continue doing business with you as we do so far in a very successful way. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. It is a pleasure to be here with you again. Paco, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, inspiring. And, uh, and uh, yeah, please thank have, you. A, have a seat. Uh, inspiring and, and very informative, insightful presentation there. A great way to kick off our discussion where we're going to be talking about unpredictability. So what does that mean in terms of that resiliency, that partnerships, that network that we need to create? So we'll be delving into a lot of those. And we've got a couple of uh, other experts from key logistics providers to do that. Quick intro for myself. I'm Richard Logan, Senior Content Producer at Automotive Logistics. Back in the UK, it is in fact illegal to work more than 23 hours a day. So we have given Christopher Ludwig uh, the next hour to compose himself, but he will be back, fear not. Um, so you're stuck with me for the next half an hour or so. Um, but enough of that, I'm keen to get on with, uh, with the panel. And like I say, I've got some great guests to introduce. Um, so my next guest has uh, over 28 years experience in logistics, transportation, and supply chain working at companies like Hellman Worldwide Logistics, Cuninagel, Geodis, and others uh, in multiple countries, uh, including Argentina, Spain, Germany, the US, uh, and Mexico. Uh, he joined premium global, uh, global logistics provider Ascent Global Logistics in 2021, becoming CCO and president uh, last year. Please welcome to the stage, Maro Rodrigo. Welcome, Aaron. How are you? Oh, 
Uh, my next guest uh, has spent the last 12 years at uh, a forward, uh, freight forwarder uh, C.H. Robinson uh, across roles in sales, business development, and operations. He now specializes in U.S.-Mexico cross-border operations, uh, including customs, trucking, intermodal transportation, uh, where he oversees uh, operations for the company's offices in Laredo, McKellen, El Paso, and San Diego. Please welcome to the stage Luca Winters. My clicker seems to be broken, so if the team can just uh, forward that one for me, and uh, that will be much appreciated. So let's get into the panel. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Uh, great to have you here. Um, Paco, building on your fantastic presentation, uh, during times of volatility, uh, uncertainty, uh, that exchange with providers uh, and your suppliers and your network really has become uh, highly, highly crucial, highly important. When it comes to sharing data and forecasting, how, how are you doing that? Are you sharing it even further than before? And how are you mm -hmm. ensuring that it's reliable and accurate during times of volatility? Well, definitely what we are trying to do, because uh, we cannot share so much in ahead, no? because of the volatility that we're living, that we all know we have on predictability every week, we have the next big thing happening. So what we do is immediate communication. Yeah? We are trying to inform as soon as we know there is a disruption immediately all of our business partners that we have such a disruption and what might be the impact for each of you and how can we support each other in minimizing the risk or mitigating the risk in a better way so that the impact is the less in both sides. No? Because we want, of course, a win-win situation where we both are affected the less by these disruptions. Yeah, excellent. And turning to our providers on the panel, you know, is, is there more information and from your perspective? How are you utilizing the data that's been provided um, from, from your, your customers and um, car makers, suppliers, when it comes to um, this planning and preparation? Is there more that can be done to, to help you perform better as a, as a 3PL and, and a service provider? Uh, Mauro, I'll come to you first. Yeah, I think that I can, but can our audience hear you? No, I think it's off. It's off. I think uh, we need to have a little volume. <laughs> oh, yeah, please, yeah. Sure. Uh, so I think it's really important to have a good understanding of uh, material planning, procurement process, having availability to that data, making sure that we understand um, how the left hand is talking to the right hand, having a good information flow, centralization of your stakeholders. Uh, we want to understand where are the weaker points in your supply chain so that we can work backwards and try to make those contingency plans for you? Definitely. Yeah, and a real life case study of unpredictability right here. So we're, we're living and breathing it here in the events world um, as well. Uh, so Francisco, I'll, I'll come to you. Um, so how, how has greater unpredictability and more frequent supply chain disruptions influenced your inventory management strategies? And how are you balancing that with the need for ever leaner um, operations? It's uh, actually trying to do magic, no? Because you have, on one hand, to fulfill the efficiency levels that we request and that we need to, to be sustainable. On the other hand, we need to ensure the operations. But at the moment, we have lowered our safety stocks, for example, no? in terms of the distances and the supply chains that we have with each one of the locations of our uh, suppliers, with the availability of our service providers, so that we can react and adjust the inventory levels, not only because of the need to be more efficient in terms of the cost, but to be more efficient in terms of CO2, in terms of area, because we are launching now and producing what will be the launch of the next Q5, and this presents additional challenges in terms of area in, in the warehouse, new processes, having to move the processes in a way that allows us to keep producing the current Q5 and the new one. And all this has to be leveled. And doing this together with the central areas in Ingolstadt help us following the strategy to be more efficient, but at the same time to have a flexible operation that allows us to react to, to all the problems that we know. Excellent. And uh, Amara, welcome back. So Thank ho you. hopefully you found your voice. Yeah. Uh, now Excellent. you can hear me. Yeah, right. perfect. Yes. So ah. during his presentation, Paco mentioned uh, 
uh, the topic of, of nearshoring, of localizing the, the mm -hmm. supply chain. Um, I'm interested to understand what that really entails from the provider's perspective um, and how you're supporting your customers sort of through that. Look, I, uh, first of all, I think that uh, I must say I, I love the previous presentation from, from Dieter because he put a very interesting topic in the table that is technology and data analytics. It's not the future, it's the present. But what is important is how to use it, right? And uh, saying so, I think that uh, especially working in premium freight and emergencies and all the stuff that we are supporting the industry on, on daily basis, it's very important the preparation and the anticipation, making sure that not only the communication with the different actors within the company, because we are dealing with logistics, but also with production, sales, you know, suppliers, customers, and so on, but also how we can prepare and anticipate different contingency plans, you know, old-fashioned way to make sure that those uh, inevitable, you know, unpredicted situation that happen, that maybe that analytics for the time being, they're not able to to give you the accuracy that you need or the anticipation, you can really react and always have a second or third plan to support the customers in this particular case. I think that for me it's a combination of you know, using the technology, that analytics, but also improving the communication and the implementation with the customers. And in our case, as experts, try to have a map all the roadblocks or potential cases that you have during the supply chain to quickly react, right? That's, mm. that's the most important part. Yeah, excellent. And Luca, I'll come to you to, to add real perspective there. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we definitely want to take a holistic approach as well. We want to understand what we see. Now, Audi obviously is a very uh, sophisticated shipper, but what we see with new market entrants coming in from a production perspective is having a hybrid uh, procurement strategy. So a lot of times they're going to have to draw down where they already have suppliers cultivated while they're creating their, their supplier base in Mexico. So we need a very good understanding of your parts database, of the classification, any specific type of uh, uh, gnomes or other uh, special permits that are involved. And then understanding exactly the forecasting of how long is it going to take for the localization process uh, to come to fruition. Uh, what's going to happen with that freight? Is it going to come domestic? Is it, is it going to stay domestically? Is it going to be exported? And then where's that tipping point? A lot of customers that I see coming into uh, Mexico now, there is a period where they're going to be drawing more from their foreign suppliers outside of USMCA while they go through that transition process of getting su suppliers more locally at the Mexico level. So just understanding that dynamic, working holistically and collaboratively with our customers, then we can, uh, tomorrow's point, go and do a very high-level process map and understand where we're going to be able to drive value and continuous improvement. And so, so yeah, it's a very interesting point that you're touching upon um, uh, the, the need to draw in from, from, uh, from international um, sources kind of in an interim period while that localization builds up. So is, is it arguably going to be uh, more volatile, more unpredictable during that time that, where there's that uncertainty before factories and plants get settled up, before ramp-ups have been established and there's good process, good flow um, within the network? Yeah, certainly. I think there's always, during the implementation process, there's always going to be extended uh, volatility periods or instances of volatil volatility just as you're going through that natural evolution of being able to get production up and running in Mexico. And Paco, I'll come, I'll come to you on a, a talk of, it, it couldn't be a, a panel in, in Mexico without talking about infrastructure, um, but when we talk about, when we talk about creating stability, how, in, how important is good infrastructure um, in an unpredictable supply chain scenario? And, and where would you like to see, where, where do you think can have the biggest impact in terms of investment uh, in facilities? Well, definitely from the perspective of uh, the whole country, we were talking uh, with Felipe before no, about the infrastructure, for instance, in customs, no? because we need a, a big deal of import and export flexibility, but also we need to invest as part of the automotive industry and the supply chain in every concept that will bring us further to anticipation and to predictability. No? That analytics, of course, systems, uh, we are standardizing all the systems across the different uh, companies in the brand Audi so that we all have the opportunity to standardize our processes. We work with the uh, groups which are having different specialities to have 
the proper investments in the proper groups, like uh, Mr. Brown was mentioning, AGV's automation, where is maybe the most important part of the investments that we will need. And on the level of country, we heard from the Secretary uh, uh, of Economics before, we need the infrastructure on the country level to catch up with the evolution of the supply chain uh, that has had in Mexico in the past two years. No? Mm. Yeah. Anything to add on the importance of infrastructure and, and where do you think could have the biggest impact, um, be it for your operations or um, just in, in supporting the network where you're seeing customers struggle? Or Look, um, I think that Mexico has a brilliant opportunity. It's a once life generation opportunity, the neo-shoring. Uh, neo-shoring is it's not something that uh, it's trendy, it's a reality. I know that uh, there are a lot of, you know, concerns about how capable Mexico will be to, to capture more of the supply chain during the next couple of years. I think that the only limitation will be Mexico itself, how much we invest in infrastructure, in technology, regulation, security, energy. You know, I think that's, that's the biggest challenge of the country. Um, I'm sure that Mexico will continue investing and growing in the way that we need. There is no turn back. I think that the geopolitical situation is pushing not only Mexico, but I would say the entire Americas to considering this. The neo sharing will not stop in Mexico. Now you see that Central America is also growing in terms of neo sharing Sooner or later, South America will follow as well, not only the Southeast, uh, Southeast uh, countries in Asia. Uh, and I think that uh, it's, it's a common work that I think public sector, but also private companies, university, you know, education, we need to all work together to make sure that Mexico is ready because uh, as everybody said before, the talent, the people, the potential, the capability, the resources are there. It's a matter of coordinating activities and especially in terms of logistics supply chain, infrastructure, it's going to be an issue. Uh, lack of uh, drivers is going to be another issue that we will have to face. Uh, compliance and facilitating, you know, custom brokerage operations is going to be critical. We are talking about volatility. Those are the kind of things that get out of control of that analytics, right? And if we are working together as an industry, uh, I think that Mexico will shine and take off from the rest of the world, that's for sure. Excellent. Talking of shining, uh, being, from, being from England, we can't go uh, five minutes without talking about the weather. But j joking aside on that, extreme weather has become a real um, talking point in supply chain. So I'm interested to, mm -hmm. to hear some examples and understand how extreme weather, the increased cases, is impacting your operations and your strategies. Um, and um, yeah, what, what role that's playing, what you're doing to mitigate that and, and work with this new landscape. Um, that's an open to the panel, um, but perhaps I'll start with you, uh, Paco. Well, we were talking uh, extreme weather, especially the cost of the Pacific, no? because mm. we are exporting via Lazaro Cárdenas or via Veracruz. Uh, it has become a major topic for us. Anticipating to these weather conditions has been a major topic. Now in our daily operations meeting, we are looking at the weather. It uh, might be uh, something that we didn't do in the past, but now, it has become an integral part of our daily review of KPIs and uh, information that we take a look and adapting our operations based on the historical data that we had uh, available for the last four years has been a major uh, advantage for us. Uh, if I ask you if you know how often and what is the probability that a vessel gets delayed in Veracruz in certain months, you wouldn't believe it, but it's four days. So. We took into consideration this information to create our forecast. And based on this information, we adapt our operations. We create new uh, strategies to be able to overcome these challenges. But it's a fact, and we need to create new opportunities. Vessels being de uh, deviated to Altamira or to other ports creates for us additional challenges, and we have to create also the processes and the conditions to operate and to be able to overcome these challenges from the program uh, steering 
up to the inbound strategies, more urgent material handling and all these topics together with the communication with our uh, service partners is very, very important for us. It, in, in terms of you know, how, how it's impacting yeah, I mean, your strategies? Weather strategy certainly uh, uh, has become a major disruptor um, when we talk about our contingency planning strategy. From a cross-border perspective, so I, I live and work in Laredo, Texas, um, weather has certainly, over the past couple of years, become more important into how we uh, provide uh, mitigation uh, for our customers. A couple of weeks ago we had, uh, actually about a couple of months ago we had uh, very high winds coming through the city. It actually took off the top of the import lot of Mexican Customs. Mexican Customs had to close for about 48 hours, so you can imagine the domino effect that that created. So just like with any disruption, though, it's, it's how much flexibility, how much mode neutrality, uh, what type of, uh, where you can shift from a custom perspective. We're fortunate in Laredo that we have multiple bridges there, and we're very close by to other ports of entry and exit along the border. So it, it's just being able to, to integrate uh, the, the, that type of flexibility into the supply chain and then make sure that we can execute off of that as well. Uh, for me, it's a very difficult topic because we shine when <laughs> there is a disaster with premium freight. Um, so it's our bread and butter. Uh, uh, we always joking that we are the sword of the logistics because we do the impossible missions when this kind of thing happen. Obviously, um, the company has been investing a lot in technology. We use all the data analytics that we have, uh, not only from the customers, but also from our carriers and internal operations. And we try to combine with uh, forecasting for weather. For example, this year when uh, there was a situation at the border, we anticipate uh, a potential you know, bottlenecks for our customers and we move part of our fleet to the border to be uh, expediting car cargo that we knew that according to the visibility uh, that we have, it was running late and it was going to create some issues. But definitely this is something that is dynamic. We are um, trying to always to combine different sources of information and making decisions together with the customer. That's why before I was, I was mentioning, especially in our case, that is time critical logistics. It's that the communication and to be close to the customers and the real uh, needs in terms of productions, uh, it's really important because with that we can take decisions together with the customer and try to anticipate or mitigate any potential roadblock or problem that they're having today with different options. By air, by sea, we are launching right now new products for fast boats, helping with port congestions, and also combining sea and air solution, or maybe expedite for one piece of the leg so in order to anticipate or to catch up the next connection when it's uh, any deviation. So um, that's a way that we try to work together with the customer combining technology, but also the 24-7 capability of highly trained people. Yeah, um, you know, it wasn't uh, too long ago, probably before the, before the pandemic, that um, it was unthinkable to budget for emergency and premium freight, mm -hmm. um, but now that has to be uh, um, certainly included in a, a deep consideration, so it's, under, it's interesting to understand how that planning and how that partnership has evolved, um, because taking that, that plan and, and working closely with partners can save them money on, on unnecessary spend. No, I that's a great point. That's why, uh, at least talking from, from our side, um, what we try to do is holistically try to understand the strategy and the programs of our customers, make sure that they are saving money overall, that we can help them to get efficiencies. Unfortunately, you know, when you have a disruption like the border crossing completely shut down or closed yesterday it happened, or, you know, when you have a weather condition like this, it's m more than... The concern about the expand, which is always important, don't get me wrong, it's more to keep on, you know, the operation running and flying. So I think that savings and technology could help us if we see an overall logistics expand for the company. That's, that's where we are going in order to align our priorities with the customers. Mm.
Excellent. Um, Paco, in your presentation, you, uh, you talked about uh, the use of technology, and we've, we've touched upon it here, but I particularly want to um, delve a little bit deeper when it comes to scenario planning, understand a little bit more um, some of the details about what platforms, what tools you're utilizing, and how that's helping you um, create stability for your supply chain um, despite this uncertainty. De definitely with the... Uh, the scenario planning, we are working very closely with our uh, colleagues in Ingolstadt to create different scenarios. We are reviewing, for instance, in the program planning, possible scenarios for the, uh, for the next uh, weeks or the next months, and how do we adapt it. But we take, uh, and let me put an example we did recently with the universities in uh, our hackathon uh, that we conducted. We took available information from the internet to try to predict based on uh, internal data, what will be the absences that we will have in the following year, uh, weeks in the plant, in the supply chain. Matching the external information, internal information, and of course the information that we exchange with our service partners or, or suppliers is bringing us the opportunity to be able to create new scenarios that we were not even uh, conscious that they are existing and we can adapt our strategies when do we do certain things. No? And we have very interesting insights about these topics. Um, maybe for the next year when we're a little bit more mature, I c we'll be able to talk about it. But it's very, very interesting to apply technology to this scenario planning with data, not only from inside the company, but also from outside. Yeah, and, and understanding where those data sources come from uh, and, and, and how reliable um, and accurate they are, I think, is, a, is an important piece of the, of the puzzle as data becomes more important. Um, I mean, I'm interested to understand, you mentioned a few there, but if there are other um, key sources of data that you're utilizing, considering, um, be it from partners or um, the internet or, or anything else, um, and, that, and that's a Open, open to all to how you're modernizing your operations, your strategies, and your thinking based on data. Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. Uh, you know, certainly one of the advantages that a company like C.H. Robinson has is just the, the scope of all of our services. Last year, we crossed about 650,000 uh, truckloads and shipments from Mexico to the United States, United States to Mexico. So this gives us, by default, an information advantage that we have access to a tremendous amount of data points. We have uh, teams that are involved in our IT department that are doing this type of game planning, scenario planning, uh, capturing all of that data, and then working very closely and holistically with our customers to share that data, be transparent in it, and see where there's area of opportunities that we can be able to uh, set our customers up for success because what we know, what the solution we have ready for today is probably going to have to be different for tomorrow, and that all comes from the data that we're collecting. I mean, in terms of that, uh, the ability to share that and communicate that, um, you say, yeah, you know, it's, a, it's a very valuable resource. Fundamentally, is the, is the systems in place for that sharing, for a secure sharing uh, of information as things stand? Yeah, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of due diligence behind that, and mm -hmm. there's a, a lot of, it's, it's an entire process, it's not a turnkey process, but we have, uh, we, we house and we store that data. Yeah, definitely. So the platform to exchange information across the suppliers all over the world is a very robust organization for us, a very important part of our infrastructure. Also to share information within plants. No? Last year, during the, the crisis, we were able to manage uh, to send parts that we were having in stock to other plants that were needing it immediately just because we were able to share this information in a secure and proper way, no? and we were able to interchange information with our service providers to have uh, the better solution financially and logistic-wise in terms of time and efficiency to do this e exchange as quick as possible. So it's, uh, for us, a key topic in our strategy. Yeah, and I think, as you mentioned there, that, that drive for efficiency, competitiveness is, is so key. Um, a key emerging tool is artificial intelligence. Um, some of its power is potentially unknown, but I'm, I'm interested to understand if there are kind of use cases, applications, or your general thoughts on, on how it can change and shape um, logistics and supply chain moving forward. Yeah, it's talking about, for example, some of the examples that we have. It's, uh, we try to 
use artificial intelligence in uh, not only analyzing documentation, also replying to customers. Again, as I was saying, communication is key and creating alerts to make sure that the role of the uh, logistic operators, they're becoming really logistic strategic people that pick up the phone and talk to the customer whenever they see an, a potential scenario of anticipation of deviation or problem and presenting the dif different options. So in terms of automation, machine learning, and artificial intelligence, I think there is a lot of opportunities on the operational side, but also in the communication and integration with providers that uh, we are scratching the surface right now. I think talking about uh, cybersecurity, what you said before, that's something that it's uh, becoming more and more relevant, and uh, it has to be tackled since we implement correctly the account, because we need to make sure that the entire ecosystem complies and it's a uh, close work in terms of sharing data and making sure that um, the customer is safe, right? Yeah, excellent. So we, we've got about five or so minutes left, um, but I do want to give the audience an opportunity in case they, uh, they want to get involved. Um, so yeah, if you do have a question for our experts and, and leaders, please do raise your hand and uh, one, of our, uh, one of our team will get a microphone to you. Um, so just while you're, while you're thinking about that, I'll, I'll continue on. Um, talking about secu security, but perhaps not um, cyber security uh, on the data point, security is a, a long-term uh, challenge and an issue here in Mexico, um, and uh, particularly around, around cross-border logistics uh, as well. Um, but by its very nature, it's unpredictable uh, as well uh, as the gangs, as the, the criminals and the crime lords, they uh, move in, in um, unpredictable manners. Um, so what steps are you taking to mitigate this, to uh, create more robust and, and secure uh, logistics operations? Paco. Well, in our case, the first one is communication with our different service providers, just as an example with Ferromex. No? Uh, as you know, the, we might have some cases where the cars are being damaged when they are already inside of the wagons on the way to some uh, destinations. So what we are doing is creating closer communication and creating strategies, evaluating also based on historical data, where are these happening, why are they happening, what measures can be taken in order to avoid this. So this exchange of information is key. Also, the early warning systems that we have also with some of our service providers, if they know that there are some dangers happening in some specific areas, then we try to create alternative routes and, and deviate our traffic, or moving and changing the operations in a way that allows us to, to be better and to have more safe uh, operations in terms in protection of our, the people working on this supply chain, or also ensuring that the products uh, that we are moving are coming safely to the final destination, either in our plant or final products to our customers. So communication is basically key. Uh, we have a centralized uh, security center with a mirror operation between US and Mexico in which we try to not only uh, apply uh, you know, technology and uh, automation with different devices uh, to make sure that we have a redundant system for tracking not only the, the equipment, but also the cargo. Uh, but also what is really important uh, is to have a understanding with whom you are working and the evaluation, the protocols that you have, defining the planning of the routes, and then the reaction. Uh, unfortunately, as you said before, Security is becoming an issue uh, more complex every day, so you need to be very creative trying to anticipate and with all the data analytics as we spoke before, try to uh, anticipate and change different routes, different planning, and make sure that, again, the entire ecosystem of people touching the cargo, it has been audited and, and secure. And in case something happened, you have a you know, uh, a reaction with authorities to make sure that you recover the goods. Yeah, excellent. And pick, picking up on a point there, um, Paco, you, you talked about that relationship and that transparency being key. And, uh, and um, uh, Luca, I'll come to you uh, for, for, for this one. Customers want certainty uh, and assurance, um, and, but they want that transparency as well. So how do you manage um, 
and predictability, volatility internally so that you can present your customers with accurate data in, in near real time or real time without it being, here's a problem, we haven't got a solution for it. So how do you manage that relationship and that balance? Yeah, so we practice what we preach. I mean, our business continuity is not only for the benefit of our customers, but also uh, as importantly for, for ourselves. So the process and the practice is very similar of what we would take our customers through when we think about disruptions, when we think about where there's weak spots. Um, we have that very well mapped out. We have a methodology behind that, a security in, in place, uh, multiple different stakeholders that give us that feedback on best practices. And then that's ultimately open and available to our customers, and it can be adapted on customer-specific needs. Uh, but from a high level, that's kind of how we approach that. Yeah, excellent. So just coming up to the last minute or, or so, um, and uh, you've been a very patient and, and well-behaved audience, so uh, thank you for your attention. You'll soon be allowed to go for lunch, but perhaps one final question from me. Um, as market volatility, disruption and uncertainty so look set to continue um, well into to 2025, I'm, I'm keen to understand what your top priorities are uh, for building a more resilient supply chain going into the new year and, and beyond, um, and really enabling Mexico to capitalize on the opportunities um, that, that nearshoring um, presents. Um, Mar Mara, I'll come to you first. Oh, please. Yeah. Well, for us, it's uh, very important to follow the strategy that it has been defined together for the whole brand Audi, as uh, Mr. Brown was presenting. No? So we have these five concepts, starting with the team, which is the most important part. If we do have a team that is able to support the other parts of the strategy, digitalization, sustainability, and so on, of course it comes to the, to the right point of time. So developing the people is for us key to be able to react faster, quicker, to use the tools, to use the technology that will bring us forward. Yeah, excellent. For us, it's uh, be close to the customer, understand their strategy, where they want to go, where they want to play, what are the key points or, or pain points that they are having or they foreseen to have, so we can also create our, our strategy and process, how we can work with them and synchronize uh, investment activities and also anticipate and prevent a couple of uh, hiccups that we will see in the next couple of years until we have all the infrastructure and all the resources that we need to continue growing the business. And Lucas, finish us off? Yeah, very, very similar. Uh, we want to make sure we have the right, the right talent, the right teams in place, the right infrastructure, the right technology, and a lot of that's going to be governed and dependent on the strategies, the shared strategies and collaboration that's being driven by our customers. Yeah, fantastic. Well, that, that real importance of communication and collaboration, partnership, um, sang throughout that, that discussion. So uh, a ma major takeaway for, from the discussion for that, but plenty more. So thank you very much, uh, Francisco Mauro and Luca. Ladies and gentlemen, um, please give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. So, gentlemen, please, thank you. Thank so you. that does uh, bring us to the end, but before I, I let you go, uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, a guest up to, uh, uh, oh, I've uh, gone, 